I will uh, jump straight to the talk. This is a collaborative uh, work with uh, other uh, researchers from the San Diego Supercomputer Center and Yale University as well as uh, our last grant was jointly with the Silver Lab at University College London. Um, so these are the three uh, sections of my talk except I may not make it to the uh, last one because just for the time, time constraint I will see how fast I speak. Um, so I think these are, I'll go through this some slides very fast because there's nothing to say here to this community, you know, the US Brain Initiative started in 2000, starting, you know, revolutionalized understanding of the brain, uh, funding from a lot of agencies in the US, NIH, NSF, Department of Defense, <coughs> private organizations, and create a dynamic picture of the brain, and then, you know, try to uh, treat, cure, and even prevent uh, neuro dis uh, neurological disorders. Uh, Um, so, um, so that's the U.S. Uh, brain initiative, and then uh, at the same time, in the EU, Human Brain Project started. Um, they are taking a more uh, simulation-oriented approach. You know, simulate the brain in ten years and uh, map all of the neurons and synapses. And again, you know, eventually going after you know, understanding neurological diseases. And uh, simulation and data sharing are, and the collaborative environment are a big part of the Human Brain Project. And they released their uh, collaborative environment this March. So uh, now talking a little bit about the large scale simulation because you know, I come from the San Diego Supercomputer Center where we are always excited about large scale simulations and I'm, again a lot of you know this. If you look at the groups on the left column and in the years you know there are simulations of in you know, hundred million cells going up to you know many hundreds of million cells and billions of cells using hundred thousand um, processors on different kind of supercomputers. And um, in in the and in the, using the K computer in Japan, this uh, Disman group in 2014 and 15 did 1.86 billion neurons. But as we know, eventually, um, you know, the, the, there will be exascale supercomputer available in you know one of the countries first, and then followed by other countries, whether it's in the you know the China or Japan or Europe or USA. You know, there is a very clear target for the high performance community, which is always good to have a target. Um, and there is some competition among the vendors and countries and research labs. Um, so, uh, you know, when I talk to the neuroscientists, computation neuroscientists, they also, you know, feel excited about having access to get their hands on access scale computer. And again, again, to this community, you know, data processing is obviously a big part of the neuroscience community and it's getting more and more uh, 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 mainstream and, and a lot of, uh, you know, the previous talk talked about data sharing and we are a little bit focusing on data processing and when you want to process large amount of data, if you are, you know, accessing a supercomputer for processing data, there's the issue of data transfer, data storage, and again the data sharing, uh, all these uh, come into play. Uh, we are a little bit focusing on uh, what can we provide for the broader uh, community, uh, not the extreme scale. You know, I know some research groups in the, in the U.S., I'm sure this is true in Asia and Europe too. Um, you know, they're following like the, the, this clinical example, thousands of individuals over decades, um, and they then have need for hundreds of petabytes of storage and data sharing. So those are exclusive people, they will have their funding. I'm trying to see what we can provide cyber infrastructure to the a broad mass of uh, neuroscientists, not the elite ones. Elite ones will always have funding. What can we do for the broader uh, community of the neuroscientists? So, um, so now the motivation for the neuroscience gateway is, uh, and I will explain what a science gateway is, and I'm sure you already know it, is basically providing a, a web uh, portal for a specific scientific community and try to hide all the issues that you have to deal with running on a supercomputer. Some of them are administrative, some of them are technical barriers. Just hide all of those from the whatever the community it is. In this case, is the neuroscience community, so they can use supercomputers. So for motivation for the neuroscience gateway was, I mean, as we again know, there has been a tremendous advance in computation neuroscience over the last two, three decades. New journals came out that are focusing just on computation neuroscience and modeling. The funding agencies or saw proposals which are, even if they're from experimentalists, they had modeling as a big part of their research or this purely modeling uh, simulation related research. And at the same time, there are a lot of development of tools, you know, the neuron, M-cell, Genesis, MOS, FreeSurfer, FSL, um, uh, all of these tools, both for computation, neural network uh, uh, development, as well as for data processing. They're open source, they're meant for parallel computing, both for simulation as well as data processing. And at the same time, there has been tremendous advance in cyber infrastructure, of course, you know, going from uh, hundreds of teraflop machines to hundreds of petaflops, and maybe in 
six to seven a year, depending on which country, or five years, you have an exascale computer, as well as data analytics. So, so all of those have been happening over the last you know, decades. And um, so the neuroscientists, uh, many of the, I'm talking a broad mass of neuroscientists, graduate students in every university, for example, who are doing a simulation of data processing, they start out small, but then they might be forced to keep their research small because they don't have easy access to high performance computing resources or cyber infrastructure, developing data transfer, storage, sharing. So, uh, uh, you know, like the uh, complex network modeling and a lot of uh, network optimization and data processing. So uh, not everyone has access to uh, um, uh, HPC resources easily, so that, that's the point. And then, uh, although there are national academic supercomputer centers in every country which is free, but you still have to write a proposal every year to get time on those machines, and that's very competitive because you're competing with astrophysicists, biochemists, earthquake modeling, climate simulation, molecular dynamics, maybe social scientists, everybody is competing for time on those academic supercomputers. And you have to write competitive proposals. The time available is always less. In the US, usually it's two thirds uh, of the time that's uh, made available versus what is requested. And then you have to understand the HPC machine and storage and the queue system and the authentication and data transfer. So these are all technical administrative barriers for um, you know, accessing HPC resources, although in theory they are available. So now we'll talk about the neuroscience gateway. So the idea is very simple. We just hide all of those, tech, hide or lower the barrier, administrative and technical barriers, so that as a researcher, you just get an account on the neuroscience gateway. You upload your model or uh, data, and we provide lots of broadly used codes in the back end on the HPC resources. You run your, upload your model, select some parameter related to the code or the data processing code, um, submit your jobs, um, then a later time, you know, when the job is done, because usually in supercomputers, there are some queue wait time. Uh, uh, you get a message, you download your result. So basically hiding all the uh, administrative technical barriers and making uh, computation neuroscience, you know, democratizing computation neuroscience for, for a broad mass of uh, neuroscientists. So that, that's the whole idea of the Neuroscience Gateway. It was uh, uh, initially funded by the uh, US National Science Foundation starting 2012. And I'll talk a little bit more about our second grant. So just to show you the number of users that has uh, grown over the years, it started, as I said, in 2013 early. We had about 100 or so users, then 200. And now we're about close to 400 users. I should mention that at the beginning, say 2012 or 13, when we you know, started talking about the Neuroscience Gateway to the community. Initially, people uh, from all kind of people got excited to try, uh, get an account and see what it is about. Uh, in the later part, so not, not all of them ended up using, because it's not exactly what they were thinking. Maybe they didn't need it, but it just got an account because thinking it could be of use and need. But later part, starting later 2014, 15, 16, these are the people who exactly knows what they need uh, HPC for. They already had a model. They had a plan to do you know, their research, and suddenly there's she scope of doing the research in a bigger way. For example, one um, postdoc I remember, who we know he graduated now, he started his postdoc around 2000, end of 13 or 14. I think he had planned out everything he will do in two years for simulation. Then we got into NSG and, and Neuroscience Gateway. He, he was able to do it in two months, so he has to completely had to rethink his whole postdoc plan in, in a good way. So, so that's an example uh, of a... Uh, you know, impact. So now I want to tell you how many uh, supercomputer core hours we are providing since we started. In 2013, it was about, as you can see, 187,000. Uh, 14, about 600,000. 2015, close to 2 million. And this year, close to 6 million hours. These are being used up by the users of the Neuroscience Gateway. So again, I, I want to say that in the back end, we, I and my colleagues, we do the laborious job of writing an allocation proposal, submitting to the U.S. Academic Peer Review National uh, you know, Supercomputer Review Committee, which uh, uh, reviews our proposal against the astronomers and earthquake scientists and molecular dynamics, everybody, and then gives us time. And we justify based on how much it was used the previous year, what kind of science we have done, how many users we see, we will see the growth and all these things. I have to say they are very supportive because they see we are providing a service to the community, so they are very supportive of that. And you can see how the core hours are increasing. And pretty soon I will write the proposal for the next calendar year. I think I'll end up asking close to 10 million hours. And every year, during towards the end of the year, I, I, uh, our time runs out. And I have to go to the committee and say, please give me more <laughs> supplemental time. And they are very supportive of it, because they realize we are serving a broader community. 
so here is a, uh, since 2013 to middle of uh, 2016, I just wanted to show you the maximum core count job that was run as supercomputer on each month and, and the trend line. You can see the trend line is uh, showing it should be you know, 2,000 cores or more, maybe a little more than 2,000 cores now. Uh, uh, but over the years, users have run 4,000 cores, uh, you know, simulations. Um, so that's one trend line. And this one is, again, the uh, uh, maximum or the average uh, uh, core count job was since 2013. And, and I think the overall average over the year will be a few hundred cores. And average, they are running on a few hundred cores on the uh, supercomputers. And on the back end, we provide access to supercomputer not only at the, our center, the San Diego Supercomputer Center, but also at the Texas Advanced Computing Center and at the Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center. So the back end, we use different kind of supercomputer, which is good because each has its own strength, different processors, GPUs, and all these things. So just uh, in agonize that we have close to you know, 370 users. Not all of them are active at the same time. Maybe it's 20% of them are you know, continuously running, depending on the research, uh, what's going on with the grad student life or postdoc life. And these are just some examples of you know, different publications or research going on, like the um, uh, group from, um, this is the Litton group from uh, downsta SUNY Downstate. Um, they are doing some evolution algorithm for developing neuroprosthesis. And then another group, uh, uh, Team Rumble, they did um, you know, uh, ion channel conductance and kinetics models of uh, rhesus monkeys. And then, um, so all kind of research going on by different groups. And there's Allen Institute, uh, um, this is Catalin uh, Mittled, he's a graduate student working there, he's working with other research at Allen Institute. They are doing, trying to develop a ground tooth for spiking model. They are producing tens and tens of terabytes. Those are good headaches to have for us to see the science progressing, but uh, you know, if everybody produced tens of terabytes, 370 users, we'll be in trouble. Uh, um, so, so it's an interesting perspective we see by running the neuroscience gateway since late 2012 until now, I can see kind of as observer of how the neuroscience field is changing or, or how the simulation needs are changing, going from computational to more data processing people. So it's very interesting to see and also see the um, issues that come with it, the data sharing and all these things. Here are examples of other things going with the neuroscience gateway. The radiation oncology group at UCSD, they, are, you know, they see that uh, uh, radiation treatment for tumors can result in neurocognitive uh, deficit in neurocognitive function down the road. So they're using um, uh, free surfer for understanding brain segmentation so they can track those things and see how we can better improve the radiation therapy. Uh, the Human Brain Project, uh, the, uh, this is uh, Michel Migliori from the EU Human Brain Project has been working with us. His uh, plan is to release a lot of the benchmarks and models and tests switch through the neuroscience gateway to the broader neuroscience community. And the uh, EEG lab group at UCSD is uh, going to make a multimodal imaging uh, software, in improvement of the EEG lab software for EEG data processing. They want to make it available to Neuroscience Gateway. A lot of things going on. I can see researchers developing network modeling, specifically focusing on GPU, because these research groups believe really, GPUs are the way to go. Again, they come to us because we can provide access to uh, GPU HPC resources. Um, Genelia Farm is looking into uh, analyzing scalable image using some latest Spark uh, pro processing environment. So all of these we can provide at the back end. So it's interesting for us to see how different, uh, you know, st we started with the large network, neural network modeling, but now we can see more and more data processing people are coming uh, um, to, to us, which is interesting observation. So, so far what I talked is the neuroscience gateway, you access it through a portal. Uh, um, you just get an account and you know, do your things using the codes we provide at the back end. But then uh, uh, last year, new, uh, NSF gave us a second grant to develop a programmatic access to the neuroscience gateway. So instead of a portal, you can programmatically access the HPC resources of the neuroscience gateway. And that is jointly, uh, at the same time, the BBSRC in UK funded uh, the Silver Lab in uh, University College London who are the developer of the open source brain. So open source brain will be the first community project that will programmatically access the neuroscience gateways HPC resources. The uh, uh, reasoning behind the programmatic access was there are a lot of big community like open source brain and NIF and ModelDB who has a large community of users and we didn't want them to all individually get account on the portal and use. They can from their familiar uh, community project environment directly use the neuroscience gateway. So that's what we are working on. So open source brain, again, I think I'm sure a lot of people here know here, it's a model development repository for, uh, from the Silver Lab at uh, University College London. We are working his, with his research scientist, Parikh Gleason, 
And um, so models can be visualized and converted through NeuroML to other um, uh, network tools. And um, so the idea is through, from the open source when directly simulations, open source when users will be run on the neuroscience gateway using the RESTful um, web interface we are providing. And again, this is, a, so you can see various kind of workflows can be uh, accommodated. This uh, Litton lab is developing large scale uh, network modeling simulation is the net pine. So you can upload your model in open source brain, modify parameters, create a net pine model, send it programmatically to the neuroscience gateway, get the results back, visualize the result. All these kind of uh, uh, workflows can be accommodated through the programmatic access of the uh, neuroscience gateway. Um, Let's see, uh, how much time do you think I have? Another few minutes? Two, two, three minutes? two, three minutes, okay. So just to summarize the neuroscience gateway, as I already said, in the various ways, neuroscience gateway is providing service to the um, neuroscience computational and data processing neuroscience community. Any user from anywhere in the world can get account on the neuroscience gateway, no restriction at all. And um, if uh, US researchers, you know, so the neuroscience gateway is not for providing someone 10 million hours, it's for a few hundred thousand, it's for the broad masses. Um, if someone wants to get 10 million hours in the US, then they have to write their own proposal and get allocation and compete with everyone else. So I think we are doing a um, service to the neuroscience community by providing ED access to uh, HPC. Since I have a few more minutes, I'll just briefly mention what we're doing next. We are trying to understand the evolving overall cyber infrastructure need of the neuroscience community, not just HPC. We are Again, you know, we noticed how the neuroscience community's processing needs uh, changed over time as we ran the neuroscience gateway. We are running a survey with 20 questions um, and almost 100 people have uh, responded from all branches of neuroscience. And I'll just show a few quick ones just to, you know, we want to get an idea of what is the size of a research lab, you know, uh, almost uh, whatever, 50, uh, 80, 90 percent is between, you know, uh, five or five to 15, and then uh, status of the respondent, you know, most of them are grad student and faculty, uh, postdocs, and then what are the research data type? Obviously, you know, uh, experimental and imaging and computational data type seems to be the most. And then um, uh, what is the size of your current research data? If we summarize, 65% within a terabyte, 35%, 10 to 100 terabyte and the future growth rate of data. Again, if we can look at the very, uh, in a, for the broad masses, you know, it's a few terabyte um, per year, and how long you want to store your raw data or, or your final data, again, everybody, you know, depending on which uh, responded, most of them wants to store it for five years or longer. Pattern of data sharing, you know, you share with immediate collaborators or collaborators internationally, and then, uh, limitations, for example, most of them say I want a first uh, restricted access for maybe one, two years, either finishing my PhD or publishing my results in the journal, then I will share it with the community. And uh, how do you want to share the data? You know, they want to sync data with the cloud and the HPC resources. Um, and then uh, I looked at what kind of HPC needs you have. Again, it's mostly, you know, a few thousand cores to 50,000 cores. But it was interesting to see that 13% uh, things, um, uh, they need uh, uh, exascale computing. And obviously 90% of them says that um, a collaborative environment is very uh, important for them. So that's what we are looking into going forward. Thank you very much, Dr. Mujumna. <laughs> short amount of time for questions this time. I'm, I'm interested by, the, by your work on the REST APIs. Okay. Uh, I mean, there, there are, I think, quite a lot of similar platforms around the world now. Okay. And I think it would be very useful if we could coordinate around uh, a common API. I'm, I'm thinking about Agavi in the US, but Seabrain in Canada and other platforms around the world. And um, it, yeah, I think it would be very useful for interoperability if these, all these platforms could expose the same API. And since you are working on it, I guess we should maybe talk about it. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, that's one of the reasons we came up to this thing is to establish more collaboration and know what others are doing so we can do things jointly, learn from each other. Um, maybe we have to move on. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you.